Hi everyone, today I have the pleasure of speaking to Garrett Ryan. Garrett is the creator of the hugely popular YouTube channel Toll in Stone. The channel covers ancient Greek and Roman history and addresses questions such as how Roman aqueducts worked and what happened to the missing half of the Colosseum. Garrett also has two other YouTube channels. The first is Told in Stone Footnotes, where Garrett does interviews on topics such as what was it like to be a Roman slave and why was Alexander the Great so successful? Garrett's third channel is called Scenic Routes to the Past, which is for all those who wish to travel and see what's left of the ancient world. In addition to that, Garrett is an author. His first book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators and War Elephants, answers all the questions you didn't know you wanted to know about the ancient world. Um, why are the statues naked? Why didn't they wear pants? And just how effective were war elephants? Um, there's also a very nice brief history of the ancient world right at the end of the book. Um, Garrett's second book is due to come out in October. Garrett, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Oh, well, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So one of your most popular series on your channel is titled A Time Traveler's Guide to Ancient Rome. It's mm -hmm. for those lucky enough to have a time machine and offers all manner of practical advice on when to visit Rome, how to behave and crucially how to avoid getting murdered. Um, <laughs> so I, like I think many of us, have long wished that it would be possible to go back and see ancient Rome and many of the other ancient cities in all their former glory. Um, but I have also wondered whether it would actually be advisable because you would be likely to see many things that to modern sensibilities would be utterly horrific. You know, lots of slavery, mm -hmm. violence, murder. If you were, if you went to the Colosseum, you would see people hacking each, each other to death. So I guess my question is, was it, was it advisable? to be encouraging people to visit ancient Rome, would they come back with, um, you know, PTSD and never be able mm. to sleep again? Ah, uh, yes. It was a little irresponsible, of me, I suppose, <laughs> to uh, advise, uh, you know, a trip to ancient Rome. Um, yeah, it, it was, uh, to our eyes in many ways, um, a profoundly different city from any that we have, um, you know, whether in the third world, any, any modern city. Um, and it was, of course, like any great city, many cities compounded. Um, you know, there, there's way, ways to experience Rome, which have been less traumatizing. Um, but uh, anywhere you went, it would have been uh, an assault on the senses. Um, everything from the smells of it, the sight of it, um, just the being there. Uh, first of all, depending on how much time you spent in Rome, it would have been just hazardous to your health. Um, even walking on the street, for example, um, as I talked about in my video, uh, wheeled traffic was banned in Rome for sheer safety reasons, at least outside of the afternoon and evening hours. But the sheer press of people often caused deaths. People were crushed against walls, thrown into sewers. Um, it was hazardous just to walk around Rome, let alone you know, your mental health being impacted. Um, and of course, right, it was a society that was uh, profoundly hierarchical, uh, slave-holding, and in many ways quite brutal. And so, uh, to our sensibilities, not terribly appealing. It would, of course, have been visually stunning in a lot of ways, going to the Roman Forum, for example, and seeing it intact, all those walls of columns, you know, the glowing pediments, the gilded roofs. Um, it would have been an architect's fantasy in many ways. Um, and so the, the visual, you know, there, there's a... In the movie Gladiator, which, you know, of course, is not necessarily historical in many ways, but has this wonderful model of Rome, which they kind of pan over in some of the opening scenes. Um, I imagine walking through that maybe in, early in the morning before like, the, the press of the crowds was too much. Um, that, I think, would have been truly striking. Even seeing the Colosseum intact with all the statues in the arcades um, and the Valerium stretched over it. But the actual life of ancient Rome, um, you know, the people, whether, you know, slave or free, rich and poor, scuttling around. Um, yes, it, it is kind of hard for, even for me, if you're talking about this and writing about it, to imagine what it would have been like. Um, I think even being with the smells, um, you know, so of course Rome has sewers of a sort, um, but they're more or less just drainage sewers. They, they, they take away the excess water from the fountains. Um, otherwise, excrement is piling up pretty much everywhere, uh, despite the latrines that they try to provide in various corners and in the baths. So that's probably the undertone of every smell that you take in an ancient Rome. It's just, well, feces. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, layer on top of that, the, the cook shops, from which most Romans ate. You know, very few had kitchens. Uh, things like roasting sausages and roast chickpeas. 
Uh, layer on top of that, the, the perfumes of people walking by, the incense from the temples, the spices. Um, I think that even one whiff of ancient Rome would have been something to talk about, <laughs> something to recall. Yeah. Um, and then, yes, imagine going into the buildings, uh, going to a temple and seeing the altars, you know, stained with blood from recent sacrifices and with you know, the incense still hanging around them. Or going through a senatorial mansion with all the hundreds of slaves you know, going through their choreographed routines and the master of the house there by his fountains in the back gardens, you know, and uh, the plants in their, their, to their sort of topiaries around him. So, yes, Rome would have been, like I said, it's a, an assembly, a conjury of many scenes, uh, like any great city. But one that would have been unforgettable if you managed to survive it and perhaps not all that pleasant. But uh, I, I stick by my... Uh, Encouraging the traveler with a strong stomach to perhaps uh, adventure uh, yeah. on such a task. It would need, need some recovery. Some recovery after. Some, maybe, maybe I, I offer counseling needs. services too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was, was, was there any political pressure to reduce the stench from all, all of the feces mm. and dead animals, stuff like that? Well, there was. Uh, so these things were – the people responsible for cleaning the streets were the ediles, these uh, kind of lower-level municipal uh, authorities um, who were often young, young members of the senatorial class embarking upon a political career. And during the imperial era, the future emperor Vespasian, in fact, was one of these ediles. And uh, Caligula was the emperor at the time, and he received, received so many complaints that he hauled Vespasian before him and had him plastered with feces from the streets, just kind of threw mud at him, well, you know, uh, feces at him from the street um, as a very pointed criticism of his job. Uh, uh, of course, you know, this is kind of the default mode for ancient cities. You know, there, there is no modern sewage system anywhere, um, and so people expect a certain degree of filth, but uh, Rome horrified visitors for much of its existence. Um, in, in the Republican era, when Rome grew quite rapidly, um, it really outpaced its own um, services in a lot of ways. Uh, Greek visitors were often uh, very dismissive of the city's, you know, uh, dank alleyways and crooked streets, and really lack of any truly monumental spaces. Um, and in general, people who came from Rome from the provinces always commented on you know, the sheer traffic, so like a juvenile, some wonderful satires talking about what it's like to walk down a Roman street and the hazards of having a chamber pot stuff in your head um, as you're walking up along as some alleyway. Yeah. Um, so there was an acknowledgement of that. Actually, several Greek philosophers um, were stuck in Rome because they fell into sewers and they broke legs, <laughs> that kind of thing, because the suits are so slick from a combination of fountain overflow and this uh, wonderful proprietary blend of muck that's over the cobbles. Um, so, yeah, people acknowledge that it's exceptional, um, but they aren't used to our sanitary sewers, so there's that level of buffering anyway. Yeah, they, they just got used to it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my favorites of your videos is on the question of why didn't Rome have an industrial revolution? And it's, it's something that I've wondered because, it, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways their society was so advanced, thinking of, you know, the aqueducts and the roads um, and in those two videos you essentially argue that there were people that would have known how to build for instance a steam engine but um, there weren't the socio-economic structures and the incentives um, to make anyone interested in that so I, I would love to know what do you think would have happened if there had been an industrial revolution? So, for instance, if an emperor had come to power who understood a bit more the value of technology and innovation and maybe put in place some of the kind of capitalistic structures that allowed inventors to get rich from their inventions. And, you know, if they built the first, you know, some, some of the early industrial revolution type machines, steam engines or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you think things could have played out after that. You know, it's hard for me to imagine a society that's both organized along Roman lines, you know, this very hierarchical society um, based on a landholding aristocracy and uh, summited by an emperor um, that is both organized that way and is uh, capitalist, or at least one that encourages investment in capitalist sort of ventures. You know, I can imagine um, some of the first industrial revolutions, uh, some of the innovations of the industrial revolution uh, in the 18th century, for example, coming into being, like uh, the pumps they used to uh, clear the coal mines. Um, the Romans had a great need for that sort of thing. They had these uh, enormous mines in Spain that went quite deep into the groundwater. 
and they had slave worked water wheels that were pumping them out. So they could have used a, a Nukeman engine, you know, that, that kind of thing to clear, you know, their, their tunnel galleries. Um, and as I mentioned in the videos, like someone like a hero of Alexandria, who, you know, has the, the, uh, you know, this primitive steam engine that, you know, could have been adapted, or at least the principles could have been adapted into, um, something like, uh, a Nukeman engine, or even like a, a primitive locomotive, given enough time. There even were railroads that cut grooves into their mine shafts so they could run carts along them on these tracks that effectively are ra early railways. So I think you can imagine um, the senatorial class, for example, sponsoring that kind of innovation um, and making more money off things like mines. Um, you know, but it, it's hard for me to conceptualize how a uh, an entrepreneurial class, like the one that transformed Great Britain and later much of Western Europe um, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, um, how that would fit into Roman society. I and mean, maybe you could you could imagine, so Roman senators, as I mentioned again in the videos, um, despite being kind of snooty about technology in general, you know, it's something that the, the mechanicals do, you know, that slaves tinker with, um, were interested in investing in new ventures. Um, they had actually investment societies in a few cases. So you could imagine maybe some senators, for example, getting behind, you know, some tinkerer and, you know, encouraging the development of a steam engine, in, you know, in their minds, you know, or, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, tracked railway. But it's hard to imagine it ever becoming much more widespread than that, you know, just because the, the, the structures aren't there. You know, so if, if the Romans, though, if we were imagine a complete kind of re- foundation of Roman society, um, a society that over the, the, you know, over time, let's say an empire never, that never falls, um, that becomes gradually more like um, early modern Europe for whatever reason. You know, then I, I suppose, you know, maybe our, our best model is thinking about almost like pre-revolution France, where you have an autocratic monarchy um, that encourages certain kinds of innovation. Um, it has, like, you know, the Fila Sulfs who are doing their thing, um, but also is not terribly conducive to an entrepreneurial class. You would have had an empire that I think would have evolved quite far along certain lines, um, you know, certain kinds of large-scale investment, um, but would not maybe have been too prone to encourage innovation, the kind of wild innovation that we see in America in the 19th century, you know, kind of the inventor working in his, you know, back shed that gets a patent and changes changes the world. So I, I think an empire that had some kind of just revolution um, might have been richer, might have lasted much longer, but might not have ever brought about a kind of modern world like ours um, in any recognizable sense, if that makes sense. It's kind of a, my, my meandering way of saying <laughs> that um, a Roman Industrial Revolution would have looked quite different from the one that actually took place, and would I think have been much more concentrated, would not have changed the lives of ordinary people as much, and um, might not have brought about the kind of, uh, you know, wide, the kind of uh, middle class based prosperity that we encourage in Western Europe and in America. And, and did, did people realize, um, you know, what technology might be able to offer i mean because mm -hmm. it, it's it seems in in some sense it was the technology of rome that separated it from you know all of the barbarian tribes that they were subjugating you know the mm -hmm. the aqueducts and the roads and you know underfloor heatings and stuff like that um i would have thought that would be you know a point of great pride for them and you know mm -hmm. what they imagined distinguishing themselves from other societies um so, so did they did they overall value technology? Not in the way we have since the revolution. Um, you know, the, the Romans obviously did differentiate themselves from the barbarians, um, though above all in terms of what we would call literary culture, that they could read, that they had a language that was refined and rhetorical and uh, susceptible to of nuance in various ways. Um, and it was more of a style of life, I would say, uh, that differentiate them from barbarians. They were an urban people. They lived in cities. Um, they had these institutions um, that, you know, of, of discourse, whatever else, that uh, those uncouth Germans and Brits, whatever else, did not. Um, but they did not have that technology in the way we did. There's a wonderful anecdote um, told about Vespasian, um, about someone who brought to him a device that would save a great deal of labor, like a new kind of crane. And uh, he heard the inventor, you know, was nodded, you know, sagely and said, this will save too much time. I want to keep the Roman people employed, you know, away with you. And so they valued other things more than just innovation per innovation's sake. 
uh, you know, obviously there were quite a few in inventions in the Roman period. Um, I mentioned in my video like this, this threshing machine, for example, kind of a, a primitive harvester. You can push through stalks of grain that tips the heads into a bin. Um, so they wanted to save time and labor where they could, but it, it wasn't, there was no sense that society should advance, that technology was inevitably heading into this upward curve, um, the sense that we've had since the 19th century, because it's, it's come, to come to pass. Um, you know, the Roman idea of the future was essentially the present. Uh, they, they didn't really envision the world changing fundamentally, maybe becoming more Roman. You know, they conquer more territory, maybe need to be stable, maybe a little bit richer. But it wouldn't be essentially different. That, that's one of the things that sets the modern world apart from antiquity. Uh, that we have this expectation of change, mm. where the ideal of antiquity in many ways was solid state continuity. Um, they didn't want innovation, or let alone revolution, in any domain of their life. Yeah. Um, so on your channel, you've not um, done any videos directly on why Rome fell. Um, so I would love to get the the told in stone executive executive summary <laughs> of um, what was it that led to the decline. And what would how how different would things have needed to be for it to survive longer than the Western Roman mm -hmm. Empire? Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I've I've shrunk from tackling that question because it's such a big question. And maybe in many ways, it's, it's the biggest question of Roman history, mm. aside from the opposite question, which is why did Rome succeed so well? You know, why yeah. did it last so long? Um, I would say that the uh, the, the short answer uh, boils down to really two things. Um, unprecedented pressure on the frontiers um, in the north above all from the German barbarians in the east also from Persia which diverted resources um, but combined with a disastrous series of civil wars um, which weakened the empire um, ended a lot of promising careers in terms of you know, emperors and generals and kept the empire from ever focusing its energies upon the external threats you know, there are longer term trends that make the empire weakened. Um, everything from uh, a trend towards de-urbanization in much of the north and west, for example, that's kind of hard to pin down why it happens, probably long term uh, weakness from urban invasions. The rise of this super rich class um, of senators um, who really don't need the emperors in a lot of ways, who can negotiate separately with people like the barbarians when they come in. Um, uh, so that weakens the West in many ways, having these kind of overmighty senators and, and de-urbanized and in some ways depopulated uh, countryside. There are plagues that roll through that kill millions and make the empire much weaker. Um, even things like the appearance of the rat, which is not native to the Roman Empire, but it comes from Southeast Asia, uh, makes the plague easier to spread through, this, through cities. So there are underlying factors that make the empire weakened or susceptible to things happening. But when it comes down to it, the traditional narrative of you know battles and invasions um, really does hold the key. I think you know the, the Adrianople, uh, Alaric's sack of Rome. You know th these moments when barbarians burst in and cannot be contained because the empire is weak for various other reasons, ranging from civil wars to you know whatever else, plague, depopulation. Um, you know there's just too many system shocks for the empire to survive in a short time. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, history is all about contingency, you know, well, the butterfly effect, one little thing changing everything else. It's not hard to imagine the empire picking itself up, even after some of these seemingly critical blows. Um, in many ways, the critical blow is the loss of North Africa um, for the Western Empire. That was the granary of Rome, even more so than Egypt in many ways. And after the Vandals take North Africa, it's very hard for the empire to sustain its military base, um, having lost its most prosperous remaining province. Uh, you know, the fact that the empire was split is another underlying factor that, you know, that Theodosius I has two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. They each are given half of the empire, and it becomes, accidentally more or less, a permanent split between east and west. And uh, these are often rival empires. You know, they don't often fight directly, um, but they aren't helping each other either. And so the fact that the west is cut off from the east's resources at a critical time is also uh, a terrible detriment to its, its survival. Uh, so I guess that that's a very diffuse way of saying that the empire is terribly unlucky, um, the, the Western Empire anyway, 
first of being hived off from the wealthier East um, at the beginning of the, of the fifth century, um, then by suffering um, a series of debilitating civil wars, um, by having these long-term trends that weaken the empire's infrastructure and therefore the tax revenues of the emperors, um, and then, of course, having this giant wave of barbarians crashing against the frontiers, uh, driven in some ways by the Huns coming out from central, you know, from uh, Central Asia and driving the Goths and the others before them, and so they come over the frontiers. There's a famous incursion uh, on the last day of 406. They they, they troop over the frozen Rhine. It's a very very picturesque scene. Um, you know, and the empire just can't deal with this many invasions. Even in the third century, um, when there had been a similar wave um, driven by the Goths against the Danube frontier above all, the emperors were hard pressed to stop them. That's when the empire was somewhat healthier overall. In the fifth century, um, against the background of all this weakness, um, they were just overwhelmed. And the barbarians did not seem to actually wanted to destroy the empire. You know, they'd been around for so long, they probably couldn't imagine a world without it in many ways. They just wanted their piece of the pie. They wanted to be within the empire. They wanted to have their privileged position within the empire. And their leaders wanted to be part of the hierarchy, wanted to be generals, wanted to be dignitaries. And so in many ways, it was people who wanted to be part of the system who destroyed the system, kind of ironically. The barbarians weren't trying to sweep over the empire. Maybe the Huns were, but most weren't. Um, they wanted to be, you know, get, had the good life, the Roman life. Uh, there's a famous quote by uh, Theodoric, um, who of course becomes king of Italy in the in the sixth century, saying that um, every Goth wants to be a Roman, but it would be a poor Roman who wanted to be a Goth. Mm -hmm. And so there is this sense, this sense of cultural, whether inferiority of difference, um, where they want what's Roman, uh, but unfortunately, the way that they try to take what's Roman ends up destroying the entire system, overloading its, you know, very fragile infrastructure at this point and um, making the empire a, a tottering wreck by the middle of the fifth century. And if, if they didn't want to destroy it, um, why could they not preserve it? Just, you know, keep doing what had been done up until that point? Well, they tried. Uh, Theodoric does kind of reconstitute a sort of you know, mini Western Empire um, in the early sixth century. Uh, his kingdom, you know, he has a Senate in Rome, he throws games in the Colosseum, he restores the public buildings. So you have this um, illiter illiterate German um, presiding over um, a Roman, a very traditional looking Roman society in which all of his courtiers, half of them are Roman, wearing togas, speaking classical Latin. Uh, Cassiodorus, one of his courtiers, is one of the, the masters of late antique Latin. Um, and, and so they did try, um, but it, in, in many ways, in the heart of Rome anyway, the heart of the empire in Italy, it was ruined by the reconquest of Justinian, which ended up being this, this ruinous series of wars that depopulates Italy, destroys many cities, um, and evolves into this you know, very bitter contest that destroys the veneer of Roman civilization. Uh, the Franks uh, also, in many ways, you know, tried to preserve what they could of the Roman legacy. They began speaking Latin pretty early. Uh, they converted to Christianity. And in the south of Gaul, especially, um, not much changes for many centuries. The same families stay in charge. You know, like, like a Martin of Tours comes from what's essentially a Roman family that's been around for half a millennium. Um, and there's much more continuity than you would think, um, even in Visigothic Spain, which we know less about for various reasons. Um, and, and so in many ways, the Dark Ages, whatever those are, we have kind of fallen out of fashion now, that term, uh, begin much later than you might assume they do. And the fall of Rome is a much longer deferred process. You know, the, the end of the Western Roman political system, the, the deposition of Romulus Augustus in 476, is a non-event uh, because there's political continuity um, on every level below that of emperor. In Italy for another half century, in Gaul for centuries beyond that. Uh, and so even though it is a catastrophe, the, the fall of the empire, for many parts of the Roman population, you know, it's not a good thing to live through the fall of the empire for most, for most people in most places. Um, it's a long, drawn-out process as opposed to an event, mm. um, which makes, what makes it so hard to grapple with and yeah. why I've shrunk again from tackling it untold in stone. And if, if you, um, with your time machine, were tasked with um, <laughs> trying to save the Roman Empire, what, mm. what would you do? Ooh, that, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> There's a few people who you might want to try to save. You, okay. So like um, Stilicho, uh, you know, the, the last great Roman uh, general. So he was the opponent of Alaric in the early 5th century. Um, you know, he is uh, murdered. Um, someone like, he might have fended off a lot of the ruin. Later on, um, Aedius, Flavius Aedius, last of the Romans. He's this great general in the mid-5th century who famously fights the Huns to a standstill at the Catalonian fields. Um, if he hadn't been murdered by his idiotic uh, imperial supervisor, Valentinian III, um, 
he's someone who might have been able to turn things around. Even in, this, in the decade after him, uh, Majorian, uh, the last great Roman emperor, who's also killed by Ricimer, his uh, Magister, <laughs> Magister Militum, um, saving one of those men might have been a way to instill more confidence in Roman leadership and turn things around. I mean, you know, you, you might go back even further to, the, to 378 and, you know, go to the Emperor of Lens and shake him and say, don't go to the Bad Adrianople. Don't fight there, man. Wait for reinforcements to show up. Mm. And that might have been the deciding factor. You know, it's hard to pick a day or, a, you know, a moment. We, we tend to latch on to battles for traditional reasons. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, if you become an advisor to one of these emperors, what do you change? You know, there, there's so many things going on and it's... It's hard to say how much of that they could have turned around at any given point, but at least at the level of battles and the level of political control, there, there are definitely points at which things could have gone very differently. Uh, the fact that the Eastern Empire survives a thousand years longer, of course, indicates the, that the system itself is capable of incredible resilience, incredible mm. longevity. It's just that this it got overloaded in the West at a certain critical moment, or a certain series of critical moments, really, and that was you know, its undoing. Yeah. Do you, do you think um, the the Republic would have had any better longevity? You know, I, I don't. Uh, just because of what an absolute mess the late Republic was. Uh, you know, the Republic in many ways was a city-state trying to govern a, a gargantuan empire. It had the institutions of a city-state. It had not really developed uh, systems um, for governing uh, territories that were a thousand miles away. They made moves towards this. Um, so like Pompey, for example, is given these um, you know, subordinates who govern parts of the empire for him during some of his large campaigns. Um, and this becomes the, the archetype in many ways that Augustus will follow um, when devising the provincial system that is in effect for another three centuries. But I think that the Republic, um, with its terribly unstable center, you know, where these, at least in the last century, these generalissimos fought battling each other out um, to become, uh, you know, uh, top dog, you know, the first citizen uh, among their equals. There was so much scope for dissent um, in Rome itself and uh, such loose control of the provinces. So I think that the, the Republican system was less, in many ways, less uh, primed for stability um, in governing a, a large empire than the Principate was. Uh, you know, the, the system that was devised by Diocletian, you know, what we call, we used to call the dominate, kind of this refined version of Augustus's system where there's more governors, there's more division of authority between civil and military authorities, um, more taxation, more officials, um, is in many ways, even though it's not, it's presented at the time because it was higher taxation, uh, a very effective system. Um, and one that survives in the East uh, for until the seventh century, um, when the Muslim, the, the Arab invasions destroy much of it. Um, I think that the imperial system itself was, in its capable of uh, capable of stability. It didn't always get there because of civil wars and other things that came into it, but it worked very well for what it tried to do, which was um, initially devolve authority to the local officials as far as you could. They wanted to have the cities govern themselves um, and then kind of just collect taxes through the cities. Um, but as that stopped working terribly well and they had to do more officials in the time of Diocletian and afterward, um, the late imperial bureaucracy, um, it worked. You know, that they, they got their taxes in. They were able to pay a huge army, an army of a half million men, um, and keep money pumping through the system despite rapid inflation, despite invasions, despite everything else. So I think the system itself, though brittle in certain ways, though fragile in many ways, um, could have kept chugging along quite long, quite a bit longer, um, given a chance to do so. Uh, it was just the disruptions from things like civil war, things like losing, losing tax revenue to a combination of invasion and systemic changes that made it all so uh, susceptible to tottering. What, when Rome became an empire, what happened to the idea of democracy? Were, and were there any, were there any kind of pro-democratic movements or anything like that? Or was it just completely forgotten? Oh, sure. Well, there's a fun... So at the beginning of Tacitus's Annals, where he, he begins with the death of Augustus and the reign of Tiberius, um, he talks about how few remembered the Republic, how few it had lived who were still alive in 14 AD remembered the Republic. And in many ways, the key to 
the success of Augustus is just how long he lives. You know, he reigns for half a century. By the time he dies, almost the whole political class that was around when he came to power is long gone. And the men who are in charge, the most powerful men in Rome, are men who have grown up under his system. And so the memory is gone in many ways of you know any kind of democratic system. Uh, elections persist. You know, people, officials are elected um, for through the reign of Augustus a little bit longer. Eventually, um, it's transferred to the Senate, and they kind of uh, do away with popular elections. But Rome had never really been a, a democracy. I mean, it had democratic elements, of course, and that officials are elected um, by a system that very much privileges the votes of the elite, uh, the, the votes of the wealthy. It's an, it's an oligarchy, uh, really. Um, so the Roman upper classes are the ones who are really disenfranchised, so to speak. They're the ones who lose power uh, by the principate because now they're reduced to being subordinates of an emperor and his family. And the emperors, Augustus, um, is, is smart enough to make them part of the system. They become provincial governors. You know, it, it's former consuls who govern the richest provinces in the center of the empire. And the legates who govern the, uh, the frontiers are also senators, almost always. Um, and so he makes them part of the system. Um, but they still resent, you know, the fact that they're now subordinate. They can't triumph anymore, for example. And it's hard to say how much what we would call political consciousness there is below the elite. People, you know, who used to be able to vote, for example, you know, for their patrons to become, you know, uh, an, an edile or a quaestor. Uh, obviously, the people of Rome can still exert power in various ways. They can still protest against the emperor. They can still, you know, throw food riots. So there's still the people still have power, but it's a much less uh, formal kind of power. And um, you know, the whole bread and circuses thing only goes so far, I suppose. You know, yeah, you're being fed by the emperors. Um, yes, you're being entertained, um, but uh, they still find things to protest against and do make their will known. Uh, the emperors, in fact, spend quite a bit of their money and time trying to placate the people of Rome. Uh, they build these giant baths. They build the Colosseum in this effort to build goodwill. So it's seen, by the emperors at least, that it's worthwhile to keep the people invested in, in the regime. Um, but there's no serious attempts to restore the Republic. Um, you know, after Nero commits suicide, you know, there, there's discussions in the Senate supposedly about, you know, well, can we go turn the, the clock back? Can we do a Republic again? And it's just not really possible. You know, eventually the Praetorians kind of seize, you know, initiative there. But uh, once the imperial system is in place and is firmly entrenched by that half-century reign of Augustus, uh, the pattern's really set. People can't imagine an alternative, and that includes the people of Rome, I think. What what did a Roman Empire, what was what was life like if you were a Roman Emperor? And what, what, what did they mm -hmm. do from waking up until going to bed? Well, it, it depends, I think, on what kind of emperor you are. Of course, if you're a Caligula, your life is a little bit different than, say, if you're a Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> But in general, emperors worked a lot harder than you might imagine they did. Um, to be an emperor was to receive a constant stream of petitions from the provinces. Everything from, you know, these very petty disputes over like, you know, where's our town boundaries? And like, you know, two farmers squabbling. They can make it always the emperor if they want to. Um, to these kind of high level uh, discussions with like, the Parthians, for example, over, you know, trade agreements. So the emperor, um, someone like Vespasian, who's a hard worker, will get up three hours before dawn and start answering his letters. He'll have two, a series of secretaries who are bringing in his petitions, and he's uh, dictating his responses, maybe using his seal ring to you know, press on the wax and uh, you know, send off these missives to the rest of the empire. Um, but receiving all these letters and then receiving petitioners in person. Wherever he is, the emperor is besieged by petitioners. Now, there's a famous story about Hadrian who is riding through some province and an old woman by the side of the road is trying to get his attention, you know, hey, Hadrian, hey, you know, and he's just ignoring her. And eventually he gets frustrated and says he's busy, you know, and she's like, then don't be emperor, pretty much. And the idea that he, by ignoring her, even her little, whatever her, her uh, you know, claiming his attention was, is ignoring his basic responsibility as emperor, which is addressing the concerns, the petitions, the questions of his subjects. So an emperor who's conscientious has to work very hard indeed. Uh, someone like Marcus Aurelius is just working constantly. Um, and wherever he is, that's where the imperial court is, uh, because the letters come to him. There are fun stories about ambassadors in different cities who follow emperors around trying to catch them as they're traveling. And so they may be gone for a year or two years in their cities trying to find the emperor and then address him, um, whether it's on the provinces, whether it's on the frontier. Uh, of course, the emperors uh, do party hard if they are a Caligula or a Nero as well. They have 
essentially unlimited money, um, at least in the height of the empire, and can do things, silly things with that money. So if you're near, you can build the Golden House, this palace that covers the center of Rome and is essentially an overgrown country villa with a huge lake with pleasure barges in the center um, and a 100-foot statue of yourself in the foyer. Uh, so things like that, that's always fun. You know, you have a huge network of villas you can visit, um, in and around Rome especially. You have gardens outside the city, um, these pleasure gardens, the gardens of Sallust. Uh, that's where Vespasian likes to hang out, for example. Um, you have a network of estates beyond that we can travel to in the summers when Rome gets too hot, um, whether in the Alban Hills, where it's a little cooler. Um, down in Campania, you can go down by the Bay of Naples and hang out uh, in Baiae, <clears throat> which everyone loves, you know, the pleasure boating there. Um, you can travel, though only really Hadrian, famously, and a few other emperors, um, explore the empire in an angry detail. And many stay in Italy, or spend most of their time in Italy, because that's what's, what they know best, and that that's where they're closest to Rome, which is the center of power in the beginning. Later on, especially, as the emperor's military functions become more and more important, you spend most of your time fighting. Um, so in the third century, especially, these soldier emperors, their legitimacy comes from victory on the battlefield. That's the only way they'd be able to become emperor in the first place, is they just campaign. Uh, Maximinus Thrax, uh, this you know giant overgrown Thracian, who is the the first you know real non-elite emperor, never even goes to Rome. Doesn't bother. He's too busy fighting uh, the the Germans who are coming over, or the rather the Goths who are coming over the Danube. Um, and so, in most in many eras, being an emperor is drudgery. You're answering letters. You know, you're you're fighting wars. Um, you're being a, a symbolic figurehead. You might be able to hang out. You know, so like some are very. Uh, enthusiastic about the chariot races. Uh, Caligula, again, um, supposedly poisons rival chari charioteers and such. Uh, they hang out with like, the you know the jockeys and stuff. So you might have a little bit of R&R &R in terms of uh, seeing Rome's uh, great entertainments. You also will also be sponsoring gladiatorial games. So part of your drudgery is finding lions and bears to show in the Colosseum, things like that. But it's uh, it's hard work. If you're remotely conscientious, remotely good, remotely good emperor, um, you're working harder than most of your subjects to keep everything on the right foot and keep yourself from being stabbed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's the saying, um, Rome conquered Greece and then Greece conquered Rome. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how true do you think that is? Uh, very exceedingly. Um, from the very beginning, really, it, we, we don't know of a Rome that is not yet influenced by Greece, incredibly. From the very beginning of Roman history, uh, the Roman gods, famously, are facsimiles of Greek gods. Um, really, there are Greek merchants established by the Roman Forum in 600 BC, we think. You know, from the very beginning, there's Greek influence there, coming up from Magna Graecia, the colonies of the south. Um, and of course, the Romans are a little bit stiff about all this. You know, they are... They define themselves in opposition to the Greeks, you know, or at least someone like a Cato the Elder will. It's like, you know, good old Roman austere virtue is, you know, the way that the way to success. But Greek influence is absolutely constant. Um, the Latin language in many ways is absolutely shaped by um, interface with the Greek language. Um, the whole Latin philosophical terminology is taken really much invented by Cicero on Greek predecessors. Um, Roman sculpture is Greek sculpture with a few Roman idiosyncrasies. Um, the whole Roman artistic tradition, despite some Roman innovations, um, is largely borrowed from Greece. Uh, the Greek, Greek culture is the mold in which Roman, the Roman elite cast themselves um, for century after century. They learn Greek as children, they speak it among themselves, you know, hang out in Greece when they can. And so, at least on the level of Roman elite culture, uh, Greek influence is absolutely pervasive. And it's hard to imagine what Roman culture would have looked like without it, to be honest. Because in the very beginning, um, you know, Greek culture is the seedbed from which it grows. You know, they borrowed much from the Etruscans, of course, to the north, but the, the Etruscans themselves are shaped by Greek influence. You know, their whole traditions um, of art in any way, of banqueting, um, are Greek in origin. Uh, and so, you know, Horace's tag about, you know, uh, you know, the savage Romans being conquered by, by the Greeks, uh, it holds very true in almost any domain you care to mention. Um, what were the biggest um, differences between the two? So, for instance, if, uh, if mm -hmm. someone in Rome had visited Athens or vice versa, what would you think would stand mm -hmm. out? Well, uh, so by the time the Romans show up, of course, in, in Athens, it's changed quite a bit from its classical heyday. It's been under a series of kingdoms, and it's kind of uh, fallen from its what it was. But uh, differentiating uh, 
high imperial Roman from classical Greek society. There's a lot of important differences, uh, above all on the level of society. Um, Rome was a great deal more hierarchical than classical Greece ever was. You know, they had an aristocracy even when they were a democracy, technically. Um, but Rome is always always an oligarchy uh, from the beginning, and it's very clear about being an oligarchy. So the whole patron-client system, for example, where you have a noble family with its you know hordes of attendants, that's a very Roman thing. That has no real parallel in Greece. Um, Roman women have quite a bit more freedom in society than the Greek women do. Um, so they famously they dine with their husbands, whereas in the Greek world, they're effectively cloistered. They can't even join a symposium. Um, also, they can own property, at least the elite level. Um, they can they run businesses quite often in Rome. And so for, for women, there's more, much more freedom. Um, you know, Romans are also much more, in many ways, interestingly, a much more open society. The Romans succeed because they are able to absorb so much, everything from customs to people. And from the beginning, the Romans, Romans are open to people becoming Roman, becoming Roman citizens, from slaves who become citizens, incredibly. That's a very innovative thing in the ancient world, to make uh, someone who was a very humble, you know, the very humble level of society, part of your system. They become citizens straight up when they're freed. Um, to giving citizenship, um, block rights of citizenship to their former opponents, you know, their rivals in Italy become citizens. Um, and that was unthinkable to the Greeks. Uh, the Athenians, at the height of their power, restrict citizenship uh, to those who were the, the children of two citizen parents. Whereas for the Romans, um, they have this very ge this generous idea of citizenship. The idea that making someone part of the system um, is a good idea, and that in many ways is the key to their success. Um, you know, if you're a Greek, you have a very limited pool of people who can become part of the system. If you're Roman, that pool is essentially limitless, and it eventually becomes where everyone is a citizen um, after Caracalla grants that in 212. So I think that's what it comes down to. There's a, a kind of openness in Roman society that's not there in classical Greece, and that in many ways is what makes Rome so successful. Yeah. It's one of the most famous stories from the ancient world is the story of Hannibal crossing the Alps mm -hmm. with elephants and then... Um, dealing some devastating defeats to Rome. Mm -hmm. um, what, one thing I've never understood totally is how it is that Hannibal wins all these incredible battles, mm -hmm. but then loses the war and isn't able to take Rome. Um, so mm -hmm. why, why do you think that is? Well, it is incredible. I mean, any other city state would have folded. Um, after late, late, late Tresemania, let, let alone Cani, that just too, the losses would have been too great for them to sustain. You know, Rome, by some estimates, lost about two thirds of its manpower wow. in those first critical ballads, battles, which is you know unthinkable in any other system. But Rome survives for a few reasons. The most important of these is the ally system. Um, I mentioned this openness of Roman society. So Rome, as it conquered Italy, um, had. Granted citizenship selectively to some communities and to their elites above all, but it made most of the rest allies, uh, made them part of the system where they had certain rights within the Roman, uh, you know, the Roman uh, Republic. Um, but their chief duty was, in times of war, they would pay a tribute of men, basically, to, basically to the imperial, the Roman, the Republican system. They would give contingents of soldiers who would fight alongside the legions in every campaign. And so that meant that the Republic had its own citizens who fought. There were you know, many of these, but could draw upon hundreds of thousands of Italian citizens um, who would fight alongside the legions. And so as they lost more and more of their men, they called up more and more of their allies to fill in the gaps. So they had reserves of manpower that no Greek city, for example, ever did. And uh, reserves that dwarfed even those of the Hellenistic kingdoms who had these very relatively small professional armies. So having this uh, system of levies of men who are called up for campaigns, both Roman and allied, gives them a kind of flexibility and a numerical advantage over almost any opponent. That, I think, is the most important factor. They can keep replacing the people they lose in the field, even when these losses are astonishingly high. Part also is the Republican system, this oligarchy that governs uh, Rome, so the Senate, basically, um, whose <clears throat> political prestige is tied very, very closely to military success. And as a class, um, I think they can't really envision um, being so discredited by giving in to the Carthaginians this way, that, 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 that their survival as a political class um, depends on resisting, on keeping the fight going. 
And so Rome's top politicians kind of had the sense, I think, that if they give up, if they, you know, let Hannibal win, that's the end of them. So they have a, a, a stake in the matter. They want to keep fighting for that reason. And also, they're lucky that they have a few inspired commanders. They have Scipio, of course, who goes off to Spain and begins uh, digging into the soft underbelly of the Carthaginian uh, war machine. They have Fabius Maximus, you know, who understands, okay, Hannibal is a better general than anyone we have. I just won't fight him. And by keeping the Roman army, a Roman army intact and just kind of, um, you know, dodging around Hannibal, uh, attacking his supply lines, trying to keep the allies invested in the system, um, Fabius is able to keep Hannibal from tearing away too many allies um, and just getting a permanent foothold in Italy. So I think it's a combination of those things. Um, the system of allies with its huge manpower reserves, a political system that is in many ways uh, predicated on continued military success, um, and a few good generals that keeps Rome from folding against the uh, incredible uh, losses that Hannibal inflicts on them in the first years of the Second Punic War. And, and why was it that Hannibal couldn't just um, take Rome? It's an interesting question. He, he did march on Rome once and apparently got pretty close, but the, the Servian walls, uh, Rome's defenses, seemed too difficult for him to tackle, apparently. Um, and he didn't manage, more importantly, to tear away the allies who were close to Rome. So he managed to win over Capua, um, and a few of the other cities in Magna Graecia, um, which became his bases for the rest of his time in Italy. But he didn't win over the Latin cities who were around Rome. Um, had he done that, it would have been a lot harder for Rome to resist than their local territories being raided as being plucked away by the Carthaginians. But because the local allies remained loyal, and because Rome's own defenses were pretty formidable in this period, he seems to have not thought it worthwhile. Hmm. And, and if you were to get back in your time machine and uh, uh -huh. having having toyed around with ways to save the Roman Empire, you were going mm -hmm. to go back and um, give some advice to Hannibal on how he could win mm -hmm. the Punic War. What would you, what would you advise mm -hmm. him? I mean, probably march on Rome, to be honest. I think you would have had to have destroyed the Senate to keep uh, the fight from going on until you were worn down. I mean, there were ways he probably could have appealed more to the other, the allies, um, and won them away from the Romans less dramatically. And ways also he probably could have combated Scipio's efforts in Spain more effectively, but probably only cutting off the head, uh, destroying the Rome in the Senate would have been the way to end the war. And he was never able to do that. Yeah. I, I, why is it that um, Hannibal won all of the battles in Italy and then um, lost at Zama? Mm -hmm. What do you think counts for that? Well, I, well, I mean, part of it is that Scipio is a better general um, than his predecessors, and he also knows Hannibal. They've been fighting Hannibal for 20 years at this point, and he's grown up in a world that's dominated by Hannibal. People are thinking about how to beat Hannibal. Um, part of it is that Hannibal's army is not what it once was by the time he comes to Zama. Um, you know, he has a lot of recent, recent levies he's fighting with. The Romans have learned how to cope with elephants. They just open their ranks, and the elephants charge through, then they're killed uh, as they surround them, and then they're butchered. Um, but it's a common, it was still a close fought thing. It was kind of like Waterloo where he, he was beat, but it, it was still a, quite a battle. Mm. Um, but it came down to Scipio being a good general who knew how to fight Hannibal's kind of battle, um, and not making the same mistakes, not being too rash, not charging in, you know, without thinking heedlessly in the way that, uh, a Flaminius had say, uh, or one of his predecessors, um, at the battles in, in 218, 216, 217, 216. Um, I think it comes down to that. Hannibal is a, a, a kind of a spent force to a certain degree. Scipio is better, and they just understand uh, how he fights much more than they had 20 years before. As a spent force in terms of he just has run out of men? Yes. Yeah, he, as a general, he's still very effective, but his army, his veteran army, um, is not what it was. He has few of, relatively few of them with him, from what I remember anyway, a lot of recent levies. And the Romans also have managed to win away the Numidian horsemen, who were an important part of Carthaginian armies traditionally. These very this light cavalry that kind of you know uh, can march around and uh, and uh, skirmish and eventually charge uh, the opponent. That they have uh, Massinissa and his Numidian cavalry, um, who are a big part of their victory, if I if I recall. It's been a while since I read about this campaign. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it, it might be a, a case of the Hannibal's di diplomacy letting him down yes. to a large degree rather than his it, fighting. Right, right. 
yeah, if he had kept the Numidians, for example, um, they could have harassed the Romans instead, and that would have been uh, very hard for them to cope with. Uh, they have to think that they're just out of money, basically, at this point, also, is a big part of why they're able to succeed. Um, so, you know, Han Scipio de defeats Hannibal, but there's also these underlying factors that make Hannibal more susceptible to being beaten mm -hmm. than he had been before. What is the most remarkable slave story that you know of? Hmm. There are many remarkable slaves um, in the Roman world. Uh, I think my favorite um, is uh, a slave girl named Musa. Um, I hope I remember that right. Um, so she uh, was sent um, as a slave uh, by uh, Augusta, Augusta, sorry, by Augustus um, to the Parthian emperor, uh, the Parthian king of kings, as a gift. She was a courtesan, apparently, probably had some special skill, probably a musician or something. And uh, she was able to win over uh, the Parthian king and become one of his chief wives, is freed, of course, and becomes the mother of the next Parthian emperor. And so she becomes the, uh, the queen mother of Parthia uh, from this humble origins as a slave in Rome. And uh, so I think that it's kind of hard to beat that vertical rise. Uh, you know, there are a few emperors who are thought to have come from slave origins. Um, so even Diocletian, for example, probably had parents who were freedmen. Um, and uh, some of Rome's earliest poets, for example, are seem to have, have slave origins. Uh, Terence, for example. Um, and, and so it's uh, the, the Roman uh, tradition of, of freeing certain slaves, making them citizens, um, means that there's a huge amount of, there are many, many stories of slaves and their children above all, who have no restrictions on their vertical rise, um, who achieve great things. Mm. And uh, you know, even though Roman slavery is, at least some kinds of Roman slavery are absolutely horrifying, whether it's galley slaves, you know, who have a, it's a death sentence essentially. Um, slavery on the fee in the fields is again, terrible drudgery. And you essentially, you know, are worn out by a life of toil in the mines is, you know, terribly grim. Um, but there are ways for slaves who have close contact with their masters, above all, so places that work in the, the great houses of Rome, for example, um, to carve out a life that uh, is surprising and often, you know, becomes, you know, quite prosperous. Mm. Which, if, if you were going to be, if you could be anyone within Roman mm -hmm. society, who do you think is the best person to be? Hmm. Yeah, not necessarily the emperor, as I've talked about. Yeah. You know, a lot of work. At least be a lazy emperor, someone who delegates everything off to his freedmen. Um, you know, it would have been kind of nice to be a senator, I think. You know, in the imperial era, when you didn't have too many responsibilities, really, you know, you might be sent off to a province to, to govern, but one of the cushy ones, like, you know, Greece or Asia. Um, you know, your life is pretty good, honestly, if you were a member of the central aristocracy in the high imperial era. You, know, you don't really do too much. You, you, there's, you, you, you go, you have, there's a certain expectations about education. You go through the system. You, know, you, you, you orate and such. Um, you hold certain offices. You take your seat in the Senate. But it's really a life of leisure for the most part. You have your villas to get around Italy and Greece, perhaps. You kind of, uh, you know, pay calls on your friends and read poetry to each other. Um, so I, I think, you know, for the the life of the cultivated man of leisure would have been kind of nice. At least I tell myself that. Um, obviously, there's a an unpleasant side to that, uh, where your leisure depends on the labor of hundreds and uh, on, on the slavery of hundreds too. Which I suppose I would, if I were a at Rome, I would have had to I would have to address. But uh, if I were born to that system and didn't know any better, I suppose that would have been a pretty nice life, uh, kind of being part of this uh, pampered elite. Eventually, you know, later on, they, 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 it's a much less pampered life. You know, when that they lose all power and uh, you know the it becomes a much less costed existence. But for a long time, it's not so bad to be a Roman senator. Yeah. Um, so for my last question, I thought something a little bit um, lighthearted. Who do you mm -hmm. think would win in a battle between Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great? Ah, that, that is a fun one. <laughs> You know, it, it's hard, I guess, so imagining them with their own armies. So yeah. Caesar with his legions and Alexander with his phalanx. Hmm. I don't know. You know it, it, in many ways, of course, those are two of the greatest generals in antiquity. Um, and uh, men who, in the case of Alexander, never lost major engagement. In Caesar's case, did lose, but never really all that badly. Um, you know, their armies were probably the two best armies in antiquity. 
uh, because they were so well honed. Um, in Caesar's case, of course, fighting Ga the Gauls for a decade, um, they became an incredibly hardened veteran force, and then fighting Pompey and winning the Civil War for Caesar in many ways. Um, Alexander's um, you know, troops, uh, his companion cavalry, uh, his, you know, the, the men who fought you know, in the phalanx, you know, trooping with him for 10,000 miles across Persia and then into India. Uh, again, hardened veterans, the man of them. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, so obviously the, the Roman legionary system is said to be much more flexible than the phalanx. Mm. Um, that's why it beat the phalanx again and again in the 2nd century BC. Um, the Macedonian kingdoms, um, uh, of uh, you know of, of Macedonia itself, uh, the Seleucids, the Ptolemy, the Ptolemies um, can't beat the Romans because they get enveloped by the, the legionary maniple system. The, the habit of leaving gaps between the cohorts uh, as they fight. Uh, the Romans learned that when they were fighting the Samnites in the hills, uh, that they became much more flexible than the phalanx had been. At the same time, they said there was nothing. There was a famous quote where a legionary in the second century BC. Says so the scariest thing he ever saw was a Macedonian phalanx advancing at him with all those spear points, the, seven, the five ranks of spear points, you know, like a hedgehog coming at him. Um, and Alexander's companion cavalry were incredibly effective at getting behind, you know, flanking and then destroying um, enemy formations. I think it would have been a very good fight, <laughs> let's put it that way. These are two very creative and very experienced generals with two very hardened forces that are used to winning, have a very, very high morale. I, I would give Caesar the edge okay. just because he had learned from Alexander. He had yeah. read all the histories of Alexander, knew how Alexander fought, whereas Caesar would have, would have been a weird anomaly to Alexander. He would have had nothing, he would not know how to cope with the Romans, having not grown up in a world where they were just a little city state off in Italy. Um, so I think that just Caesar coming later and knowing Alexander having a military system that was, at least in theory, more flexible than Alexander's might have given him a short edge, a bit of an edge in that fight. But Alexander, being Alexander, <laughs> who knows, might have pulled it off. He, was, he wasn't too much of a slouch on the battlefield. Yeah, have, having all of the... The fact that Caesar could study all of the strengths and weaknesses right. of the phalanx, I suppose. That helps. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but a fun question to think about, like so much in history. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Of course. Well, it's been wonderful. Thanks for having me, Henry. And uh, yeah, it's always fun to kind of play with these scenarios and think about what could have been and might have been. Brilliant.